Um, so I'll be talking uh, today about germination semantics, um, <clears throat> the more, more popularly known as the cost model in documentation for our chain, but cost model is not really accurate, so I figured I'd take the opportunity to change some of the lingo. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, yeah, so um, basically, um, as an overview, I um, am going to outline why we need termination semantics uh, or you know, a, a model uh, you know, such as the gas model for Ethereum, an analogous model for our chain, uh, why that's necessary, what problem it solves, um, and kind of what Ethereum tapped into when they you know, came up with their model. Um, explain that and then go over what's specific to our chain, the problems that we face, and eventually some code. So the main issue is pretty simple. Um, basically that, you know, if we don't charge people to run programs, then you can DOS a miner. You can um, deploy a program, since we're laying is turn complete, that reduces infinitely. Um, and obviously we would like to avoid that. Um, so uh, in the same spirit um, as Ethereum, um, and really it's, you know, for any distributed system that offers, you know, like computation as a service, we want to charge the people that are using uh, minor resources. Um, what we're looking for is a framework to do that accurately, um, and one that allows us to preserve the concurrency semantics of the language. Um, so, uh, we can say that the termination model consists mainly of two parts, or I like to think of it, uh, you know, as having two sections. Um, the first part um, involves uh, making termination proofs. And I know it looks like a lot, but it's, it's really simple and we'll go through it quick. Um, but basically, uh, basically the, the gas model as Ethereum formulated it. Um, was tapping into you know, a, a method for generating termination proofs that has existed almost uh, you know, as long as the halting problem itself. Um, so when Turing published uh, his findings on the halting problem, essentially 13 years later, um, he introduced you know, essentially this framework to say, um, or that allows you to convert a non-terminating program into a program that terminates. And we'd like to do this for rolling. So, um, yeah, take sigma to be a set of, you know, Rolang program states. Um, w, a well-founded set, um, and just as a brief reminder, um, a well-founded set is just a set that has a least element, so a bottom. Eventually it bottoms out and there's no lower you can go. Um, and then a set of operations. And the idea is to map the states of the program to elements of this set, right? And so even though my original program might uh, continue infinitely, if I can map the states to a set that I know terminates, that I know has a bottom, then I can prove that my program also has a bottom. That's the general idea. Um, so the first function, uh, the termination argument search, um, we can think of that as, as a balance. Whatever we decide W to be, uh, whether we decide for it to be, I don't know, the set of natural numbers, um, whether we decide for it to be tuples of natural numbers, um, or essentially any uh, well-founded set that we like, we can think of the argument search as a balance. It says, a given program state, I have this much of W left, right? So, so this is, so if this is uh, essentially like, you know, for example, to, you know, stick with a lingo that we all know, um, on the EVM, if this is um, uh, my program state, then this is a function that says, okay, given a program state, this is my remaining gas balance, right? Nothing so far that, uh, sorry, let me check. Is that clear? More or less? Yeah. If anybody has any questions, feel free to holler. You use the W well-founded set as a saying it's a gas. Why is that? Oh, um, because, yeah, essentially, um, Good question, yeah. Um, gas is, uh, or a set of natural numbers is a well-founded set, right? So all non-negative, um, you know, integers, right? Um, so if I have a balance and then I decrement, right, all the way down, right, um, then eventually I'm gonna hit zero. Okay, so that was their, that's what they chose to represent, um, to represent this kind of descending relation, right? But my point is that it doesn't necessarily have to just be, um, you know, a, you know a, just a counter. Right? Um, is, does that kind of make more sense? He, I guess I'll see. He's, he said it, he's, 
Pavel, he's, he's setting it up so that we can talk. Got a, I got a mic. So he's setting it up so that, that he can talk about phlogiston, which has, it's a four component thing. Mm -hmm. Right? So he's, yeah. Because, you know, the Ethereum model is gas is a number, right? And, well, and, and in, in our chain, the, um, the phlogiston is a four component thing because they're trying to measure across different resources. Right. And right. so he's, he's saying, well, look, there was actually, Turing thought about this a long time ago. You just make it some abstract, well founded set. Mm -hmm. right? It doesn't have to be just a number. Right. So I'm saying our measure can vary, right? Um, and in fact, uh, you know, well founded sets in general, um, they are valid for induction. So, and, and that's what Turing realized essentially is like eventually I know I'm going to reach a bottom. So if I can prove that uh, a certain predicate being true for now implies that it's true for the next value of my counter, then I know that it's true for all values of the set. Um, but anyway, uh, we should probably move on. Um, uh, so the validity check, yeah. Uh, that's number two. Essentially, that says that, um, that the balance that we talked about earlier is decreasing. It says that if, uh, if P and P prime are states, right, and we have a transition from the state P to the next state P prime, right, and that the balance of this program, state P, is greater than the minimum of whatever we choose for uh, W to be, right, if this is true, and that implies that the value decreases, our balance decreases, then we know that uh, the balance decreases across the entire evaluation, right? So as long as it's decreasing, and as long as we have a bottom, we know that we have an endpoint. And that essentially provides a termination proof. Uh, why isn't that second condition that phi of p greater than or equal to min of w automatically true? Because it's mapping into w, and how could you be below the bottom? You don't have to have a continuous function. You can, it, could bounce, it could bounce all over, right? OK. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> cool. All right. Um, yeah. So the the third function, which uh, Turing did not include um, in uh, his original publication, was that of a cost model. <laughs> um, hence my desire to uh, change the lingo up a bit. A cost model in general is just a mapping um, from operations to a cost for that operation. Right. You say, um, okay, so if if um, <coughs> omega is a set of operations that I can perform, right, and we're not committing to what those are going to be yet, right, if you give me an operation, I'll tell you how much it costs, okay? And what that does is it allows us to tune um, this check. If I can say that I know I perform this operation, and so I change from state P to P prime, then I can decrease um, my P value by the cost of that one, right? And you know, just to stick with the lingo we know, on the EVM, if you um, perform an operation, you decrease your gas balance by the cost of the operation. My point being, this is a much more general picture, and we have freedom to play with it. Um, yeah, so to recap, this gives us an endpoint. This tells us that we're approaching the endpoint, and this allows us to affect the speed at which we approach the endpoint. <coughs> um, yeah, and so, uh, you know, uh, essentially, like Ethereum understands very well. They, um, you know, the idea is that we can leverage economics to disincentivize bad behavior in a decentralized setting, right? Um, so if this is a termination proof part of, um, of gas, we also need an economic proof. Um, and the reason we need this is because even if we can, you know, force a program to terminate, um, a rolling program that runs for, uh, for a billion years is, is only marginally better than one that runs infinitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we want to disincentivize um, people from deploying even long-running computations, right? And so we'll be able to unify these concepts essent essentially by having the deployer pay to get the initial um, balance, right? Stuff we already know. Um, so this part is all similar, right? Um, Greg mentioned that uh, flow does become, uh, that's our analogous term for gas, is phlogiston flow. Uh, I mentioned that it was a four tuple. I'll expound on that a little bit later. For now, we're treating it as a one tuple <laughs> that only uh, quantifies uh, compute complexity, not uh, any sort of uh, other spatial complexity, network access, anything like that. So right now, it's just the operations you perform. Cool? 
Um, yeah, okay, so um, this stuff should all be familiar too. Um, basically, when you deploy uh, a program, you specify a pH limit. Um, uh, here, we've chosen uh, pH to be, uh, or flow, to be from the set of natural numbers. Uh, conversion rate, um, and then this, you know, it uh, essentially, since pH uh, lim is a natural number and our conversion rate is in rev to natural numbers, then when we multiply the two, we get the amount of rev that you're going to have to take um, that's going to have to be taken out of your wallet to pay for this computation, right? So once you've purchased the flow, then uh, you get to set your initial balance and then proceed with the termination proof as in the last slide, okay? So, so much, so, so far, you know, all the same stuff that, that we're familiar with. <clears throat> I just wanted to point out that we have freedom to play with the model. For example, um, if we choose our set to be um, the set of Rolang terms and our order to be this, uh, a, a subterm relationship, um, then as long as the program that you give me is decreasing in size, right, as it reduces, then I can prove that it terminates, right? So that's as an example that we have freedom to play kind of with the set. Of course, that's not true <laughs> with rolling in particular because we allow replication. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about next. <sighs> okay, um, so as opposed to the uh, uh, as opposed to the EVM, where uh, essentially the cost of uh, bytecode is uh, specified and uh, state changes are specified at that level, um, Rolang has um, a very tractable uh, model that's, at least I would say, is uh, fairly apparent in the code. Right? We have, it's, it's pretty obvious, or you can see and reason through the semantics of the language, tie that to the model that uh, we are given, which is RoCalc and then kind of estimate how, your, how, how the messages in your program are going to flow, right? Um, and I think it's desirable for programmers to be able to tell how much their program is going to cost, or at least get an idea of how much certain portions of their program is going to cost just by looking at the source code. So we don't need to specify the cost of operations in terms of byte codes or op codes. We specify it in terms of the language constructs, which the model allows us to do. Right, um, so how do we build the checks that I first brought up into the evaluation of a program? And how does that affect the evaluation of the program? Because we're concurrent, right? So if I have to, if, if I have to alter my program originally to deduct a counter, right, then by nature of providing the proof, right, I've altered how my program is going to run. So we want to minimize that as much as possible. So we get um, three flow-specific evaluation rules. Um, and I think they it, at least kind of complement uh, the original um, inference rules of the row calculus um, uh, in some way. But the first one essentially says, right, um, that if I have a flow balance associated with a process, and that process is a par, then I can give both components of the par replicas of the initial flow balance. So in this case, um, and if anybody's unclear as to how we got to that point, feel free to speak up now. Well, if, you were, if you were duplicating the money, that would be bad. But yes. I, I, we'll see in the next rule, I think, that you can think of pH as more like a pointer to a wallet, because when you decrement it, all of them get decremented. Yes, uh, yeah, in, in spirit, yeah, no, good point. Uh, that, that was, yeah, that, that's helpful. Um, so not quite a wallet, right, because we don't want all uh, decrements from a flow balance to have to um, be verified as transactions because that would be abysmally slow. Um, but you are correct. We can think of uh, the flow balance here as a shared global counter. And that's what the second rule uh, addresses. So we have that if, um, if, we're, if we have a, a, an expression P that has a flow balance, right, 
And that term can reduce to p prime, altering its flow balance, because we have to deduct for the operation that we performed. And pH prime is greater than zero, then I can do this modification to flow concurrently. And I can have that modification witnessed by the other processes that have a replica, just as Mike said. Right? So pretty straightforward. Good? Cool. Uh, and then finally, uh, to enforce our invariant, we have that if uh, p can reduce to another expression, um, and it tries to yield a negative flow balance, then it just becomes nil. So we cut the legs out from under the process, and we don't deduct the flow. And your computation's over. And that is a point of some contention still, because we're considering allowing you to add more flow right. after the fact. But yeah. Yeah. this is a pretty good initial proposal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do, yeah. Is, do, go you, in, do you go through the concurrent execution if, if P and Q both reduce? Uh, do I show examples? Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank God. <laughs> yes. I come prepared. Okay, let's start with arithmetic. Always a good uh, demonstrative, demonstrative example. Yeah, so um, the deploy function at the top is uh, the same one as was defined um, essentially in Michael Birch's paper, or, or sorry, presentation, um, at least in spirit anyway. Um, we have You'll have to trust that I know what the fields are. But we have a bunch of extra fields that I, that I allotted for space. And the program, 1 plus 1, par 1 plus 1. Um, and then an, in, an initial flow balance, just to start simple. Okay. When we call a deploy function, just as it was defined in the last presentation, we take the program and we par it with the current blockchain state, which is S. Okay. In doing so, we associate the initial flow to the top-level process. And by a rule that I showed in the last slide, we can say essentially now that if I have a flow paired with a top-level par, then I can distribute that. Okay? So now both of these processes can reduce concurrently. So let's say that our process on the left, not quite reduce, but is evaluated first. 1 plus 1 is 2. Cool. All right, let's say that it costs one flow to add things together. All right, so flow is decremented globally. Pretty simple so far. Let's say that the right process is evaluated next. That's going to take it down to one, ending up with the final process of two, which is effectively nil, because we don't do anything with that two. Is everyone clear on that? Because it's kind of foundational. Yeah? Pretty, pretty simple? Cool. Because addition is commutative. They'd gone the other way. Right, yeah. And, and we'll see, like, uh, with uh, the, um, essentially how I'm building the cost model, we, we want to build the counter to be co commutative. So we want, in, in any case, I mean, you know, addition, subtraction, or commutative, but we want to maintain that modifications to the counter, uh, or that the counter is eventually consistent. But um, if you, I guess we can talk implementation after, if you want. So, um, right, so let's say that. Um, I added another, another one plus one, right? So I need three flow, I only have two. We're gonna go through the same song and dance, um, evaluating left to right. As we see, we're distributing across um, three processes now. Um, left evaluates, middle evaluates, that takes us down to one, but one plus one has yet to evaluate, okay? Um, so when we try to do that, we are gonna yield, or we're gonna try to yield, a negative one flow balance. And that's really bad. You're not allowed to do that. So we're just going to take the entire computation and squish it to nil. Uh, you don't get any of your effects. Um, flow stays the same. And all the rev that you attach to the contract is forfeited to the miner. You know, if you call it out of flow status, then it would be oops. <laughs> yeah. I I did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oops. Yeah, right? <laughs> oops. <laughs> All right, that's a laugh. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so to describe more uh, complex processes, uh, we're going to need, um, and uh, although uh, I, I understand the intent, and it is, it is very simple to say that uh, all of the R-chain blockchain is 
the entire state is a giant Rolang term, there is another component, which is the tuple space, and you can treat these as separate entities. Um, and so to kind of get a better idea of, of how um, we interact in the store and how flow kind of impacts execution uh, or uh, evaluation, we're going to introduce a small tuple space grammar, uh, just so we can describe you know, how, how storage kind of looks as we're evaluating. Um, so T, tuple space, is mapping from channels to data sets. Channels to a list of data. And your data can be a message, a persistent message, a read with a continuation, and a persistent read. And in the store, we keep flow balances with those. Clear? Cool. Yes? Question from the guy who's writing the storage. Well, I just <laughs> wanted, to, for, for people who are somewhat familiar with the way that our space looks right now, I just wanted to map those four things onto current. So yeah. the first one would be a produce with the persist flag set to false. The second one would be a produced with the persist flag set to true and some caveats. Uh, then we have a consume, persist, false, consume, persist, true with some caveats. Thank so. you. Great. OK. Oh, one other thing is you've simplified the consumes to be only on a single channel. And that's fine for the presentation. Yeah. But it's not accurate. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. <clears throat> um, OK. So let's say we want to deploy A. Let's say Alice wants to deploy A. Alice is going to call the deploy function on her program, um, which is going to par it with the state of the blockchain. It's going to be given some amount of flow debited from Alice's account. And let's say that the first um, term to execute or sorry, oh no, right. OK, so we see our tuple space, yeah. We see our tuple space at data feed, right? So that's a quote, that's a channel. It's currently empty. It's kind of like an idealized tuple space where nothing else, no other activity has happened over at data feed. We know that we can distribute flow. And let's say that the persistent send executes first. When the send executes, it's going to place at data and a modified flow amount at, at data feed. Right? So what we have here is essentially that data was quoted, uh, turned into a message, stored, and because we sent, we have to decrement flow by some amount. So that's why it goes from pH to pH prime. And we notice that the uh, input has also witnessed the decrement. And the reason, and keep in mind, and I'll kind of demonstrate this later in other examples, but keep in mind that the reason that these flow counters are the same is because these two terms were deployed together. You use deployment to scope who pays for the program. If it's deployed together, then it assumes that all computation that occurs as a result of the deployment is paid for by the deployer, with a caveat, but we'll talk about that later. OK, so send executed. The receive is next to execute. So since send is persistent, it's effectively equal to send. We have x bang bang q equal to x bang q par a bunch more of those, another x Bang, Q. Can everyone see that? Yes. All right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we have to treat uh, the evaluation of uh, X double bang Q at least to be accurate from a language perspective and to be accurate from the intended semantics of the language as if it is a replicated send, right? And there are issues uh, kind of with this that we have to address, which is like that doesn't terminate. That just keeps going forever. If you put X bang bang Q to the blockchain, then ideally, it stays there forever. <laughs> so we have to find a way to kind of uh, ameliorate um, the situation. We have to find a way to reconcile persistence and um, with efficiency and with finding someone to pay for it, essentially. Um, 
So since the send is persistent, when the input executes, okay, it's going to take the message. Um, it's going to take the message out. That's going to take this counter uh, ph prime down to ph double prime. Since the message has been taken out, it has to be put back in. That's going to take the counter from ph double prime to ph triple prime. So what we saw is that when we have something stored, the send in the tuple space, right? You have to pay for every additional send that you put. Um, or every additional time that you put the data back into the store. That's my interpretation. Um, but so this is a precursor to a rent model. Well, no, 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 no. Actually, actually, no. Because in, in this case, thanks. Good question. It's leading. Um, <laughs> um, so in this case, we're still talking. We're we're still paying for operational complexity. This is just time complexity, right? We're paying for the action of sending the action of receiving, the action of putting it, of sending again, okay? Um, what Greg's talking about is, later I'll introduce someone informally, um, the concept of rent, which is a persistent payment. Okay, so after the message is read, it's substituted into the body, which we can uh, turn around and see. We had drop Z there, so Z is substituted for at data. So we get drop at data. And now we're going to have to perform the drop, um, converting the process on the top to just plain old data. And that costs one as well, so we have the quadruple pH. And that is going to be our resting state. So that's the final pH value. That's one evaluation. <laughs> um, so is everyone pretty much clear on that? Yeah. Any questions? I'd be happy to pause to take some. All right, cool. Um, so as I said, deployment uh, scopes uh, your payment plan, right? So let's assume that you have, instead of just Alice deploying A and paying for everything, the entire complement uh, inside of the program, let's say that you have two different entities um, defining P and Q. We can think of P as a process that was created to persist data to a data feed, right? Um, but we don't always want the person or the, the entity consuming the data to pay for the continuation. We want to be able to separate the payer from the sender. And so we do this by deploying them separately. Since they're deployed concurrently, they're handed uh, two different counters, PHP, PHQ. Now all the costs that were shared in the last evaluation, are going to be accumulated in their respective um, repositories, in their respective balances. So what Q does doesn't affect the balance of P. What P does doesn't affect the balance of Q. And what we should see, if we're witnessing the same behavior, right, and the same costs are still achieved at the end of the um, program, is the same amount of ticks, right? We're still executing the same actions. They're just based in different kind of uh, repos. Um, and we see that to be true. So we see that PHP has two tick marks, so it's executed um, at least two actions, and that Q also has two tick marks, giving a total of four, which is the same as the last evaluation. Um, so contracts. Yes? Can you go back to that? Sure. Yeah. Okay. There. Um, so the the P double prime on both of mm -hmm. the two different entities that we instantiated and then sent some stuff to. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm thinking that if these were in different uh, namespaces, mm -hmm. uh, because it's a transaction that's crossing over or something, um, and based on some of the operational complexity economics if there was a different cost of performing the same action in these different namespaces, that would not invalidate this logic because the prime on uh, pH double prime in Q can represent the operational complexity cost of Q. And the other one will keep it in its own and then it'll come back and tell you how much the whole thing costs. Is that right? Or no? 
That's the thinking. Okay. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, <laughs> um, it's important, and, and the concern that we, um, the constraint that we have to enforce is that uh, within a given validator uh, set that they're using the same measure, right? Because we have, to, we have to be able to validate that, you know, like when I run a program, when I have validators validate my program, um, no matter what execution order they go through, right? Or, yeah, no, no matter, yeah, what execution order the program grows through, since we reach consensus on COM events, if we have the same execution, if we reach a consensus on a particular uh, pathway, um, then we should arrive at the same flow bounds, right? So even though the language is uh, non-deterministic, we have determinism um, in the end result of the flow bounds. Um, so if, yeah. So the, yeah. Cool. so the measure is a parameter of the namespace, is that what you're saying? Yes, ideally, yeah. And how do you set that? Like when does that get set? Because a lot of namespaces aren't going to be populated when the network is initialized. That would, ha I mean, it would have to be. It would have to be set when the namespace is created. They're all created at the very beginning. When the regions. The, so well, the regions are created, right? And the namespaces then have to exist. Everybody has to know at the very beginning what the, the measure is. Yeah, it's the it's the region that's going to the specification of the region has to come with the the measure. So if you have two regions with different measures so and you want to combine them into a single namespace. You, when, you, when you go up into the join, right? Then so there's something to work out there, right? Is how you combine two measures that might not be compatible into a new one? The, the, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So you either take the min or the max or some yeah. combination. Exactly. Okay. One reasonable way to do it would be that the cost of running in A join B is the cost of running in A plus the cost of running in B. Yeah. Another difference between the regions is going to be um, the extra off-chain stuff that they provide access to. And those can be... Um, those off-chain resources can have their own um, phlogiston costs for accessing. So if you're doing oh, off-chain yes. storage as a service, um, that can be exposed as having some phlogiston cost. Well, my opinion on that is that it has to be standardized in the language, essentially. Like if, if, b because we're basing the payment semantics on like, the specification of the language itself, um, and we want the... Right. We, we essentially, we want it to be defined for the entire language if it is defined at all. Right? So if, 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 you're, if you've written kind of a, a library, right, that I suppose like includes functions for accessing storage, off-chain storage, then yes, that's fine as long as it's part of the uh, language distribution. Right? Does that make sense? The stuff that's written in Rolang, sure. Yeah. Anything that happens off chain, there's nothing in the interpreter that knows about how it is, and so the region just s declares by fiat, this is what it costs. Yeah. If you want to use this. So, for example, if the region offers a SAT solver, right, then it just declares this is how much it costs to run SAT solver. Contracts. Um, so in the last presentation, Kyle mentioned that uh, fours and contracts were, there, there's a slight semantic difference between them. Um, and the semantic difference arises at the level of payment. Um, normally these would be the same. These, um, these would be just like different ways to specify the same thing. Um, but we're using contract instead um, as an expression of intent to not pay for something. And this is useful because it's, in, in a lot of cases, it's useful to be able to separate um, or to be able to choose when the sender pays, right? So the, the entity causing the continuation to execute pays for the continuation, right? In line with causality. You sent the message, so you should pay for the result. And of uh, being able to separate the sender from the receiver, as in the example of the data feed that I gave before. So we want both options. Um, and the way you can think about it is that when 
uh, use call syntax, you link at runtime whatever flow counter is attached to the call to the, to the continuation of the contract, right? And think about if we didn't do this. Think about if, if the uh, persisted for were the same as a contract and that you deployed the contract. What would that mean? That would mean that every time your contract is invoked, you have to pay for it, which is suboptimal for public processes. So we give an option. Um, so I have an example of um, what that difference would look like. If we have Alice and Bob, Alice is deploying a contract, Bob is deploying a four, a persisted four. They deploy concurrently, get their respective flow balances. Alice's flow, Bob's flow. This idealized tuple space with the channel X is empty, no activity so far. First, let's say that Bob's persistent four is put into the tuple space, right? So he's going to store permanently z.p. That's going to say, if you send something here and it matches z, right, then execute p with z substituted for the message that I get. Noticing that Bob's flow is decremented by the cost of the receive, which we're saying is prime. <clears throat> Next, let's say that Alice's contract deployment executes. Okay, so it's put up to the blockchain. We can think of this as the initial read being the same as a persistent read, right? You read from the channel X, and then you store the continuation there. But when the contract's put uh, into the tuple space, it's not given a flow counter. So if you tried to invoke it without giving it flow, um, well, you wouldn't. But if you could try to invoke it without giving it flow, it wouldn't execute. Um, so essentially, contract waits there until it's given flow to execute. And probably a good point to mention is that if you try to use send syntax to invoke a contract, it's not going to reduce. If you try to use call syntax to invoke a persisted for, it's not going to reduce. So the syntax constructs have to be dual, right? We don't evaluate anything else. So it was something to mention. OK, cool. So this is the last slide. <laughs> um, now let's say that um, in parallel with the um, persisted for in the contract that I just deployed, let's say that we have two entities trying to invoke these, right? Let's say that we have Carol and Dansworth um, <laughs> trying to, <laughs> I don't know if that's a name. Um, <clears throat> and <laughs> and um, Dansforth is trying to uh, invoke the persistent four by sending it a message, and Carol is trying to call the contract. <clears throat> um, so these are only going to meet with their respective duels. Um, Carol's flow is going to be linked to the contract. Dan's fourths is not to the uh, persistent um, read. So what we see here um, is that the original flow, the persistent uh, four, was given is used to fund the continuation, right, BB. <laughs> and that C is threaded through uh, the receive and the send to the continuation. And then, um, oh, and of course, since uh, they're both persistent, they both stay on chain. Um, and the modifications to flow of B were recognized for the persistent read, but since contract doesn't store um, any flow, it's just stored with kind of like a null reference. So that's the end of um, operational phlogiston. <clears throat> um, it gives a very uh, kind of like a, a very natural, at least I think, uh, flow as to we're easy to determine from the source code where your money's going to go and who's paying for what, um, which was the intent on the outset. Now, the end. Um, question? You were going to get to storage. That's right. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> cool. Let's get to storage. Do I have a marker?
OK, um, so because Rolang's an asynchronous language, we can never really know when a program um, has reduced entirely, at least without like runtime reflective checks, right? To be able to determine entirely that, you know, if I've stored a read in the tuple space, that no write will ever come along and invoke that continuation. It's just not something we can know. Um, so there's the potential for uh, messages and reads to hang out in storage forever, right? We can't just say that, oh, because you haven't gotten a response for some arbitrary amount of time, we are going to reduce, um, or sorry, we're going we're gonna to take your thing out of, out of the tuple space. That, that would, at least that would seem to be an arbitrary measure. Um, we need a way to uh, reconcile um, persistence with compensating miners for their resources. And to this end, we've introduced, um, we've introduced another component to flow. And this is a fast follow from Mercury. Um, so uh, for sure, um, building the model to cover operational costs. Um, and if it's not included in the Mercury re release, it'll be a fast follow. Um, the idea is, at least is this, this is my idea for it. <laughs> Um, is that since processes proceed and they get operational flow, that entities that persist uh, things to the tuple space should get their own form of flow. And those would be channels. So processes get operational flow, channels get storage flow, right? And we want to we want to create a framework where you can time. Um, activity on a channel, essentially a pay-to-play um, access to the channel. So we can say that if you were given uh, 10, 10 storage flow and 10 storage flow buys, um, I don't know, 20 days of reads and writes, that the channel stays open for 20 days. At the end of those 20 days, we have a choice. We can say either, you know, unequivocally, we're going to remove uh, everything from the channel since your flow ran out. Or we can try to offer a way to refill that flow, because we have cha we have uh, processes that need to maintain an internal state. For example, Now, no one's ever going to read from X, but if we introduce this idea of storage flow and we say that, okay, when you introduce a channel, right, the entity associated with creating that channel is going to have to provide some means to pay for access to the channel, okay? So this is Alice's channel. We put it into the tuple space, and inside of this, in, inside the scope of the channel, we deploy a, a contract. And every time the contract's invoked, and I suppose actually now that I look at it, it's never going to be invoked, but. No, that's not true. No, because foo's not limited to, yeah, scope. So it could be invoked. Um, if we say that Alice gets 20 days to run this channel, and that over those 20 days, we'll, sure, process whatever you want, right? We'll, we'll do all these sends for every invocation of the contract. And at the end of the 20 days, we say, OK, time's up. We're stripping the channel. It precludes contracts from maintaining an internal state. So it seems to be that if we introduce a method to pay for persisted storage, then we also have to provide with it a method for uh, refilling flow to pay for persisted storage. Um, so that's kind of the motivation and the idea. How does this fit with the definitions that we gave in the first slide? With our validity check and our argument check and with our cost model. Joe, are, are you, are you going to, like, because obviously storage isn't just time, right? Storage is 
total amount spatial, of spatial, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so are you going to touch on that or? Sure. No, that's that's good. Yeah. Okay. If you were wondering, other people were too. So, um, yes, uh, storage um, by nature needs to be a, a spatiotemporal cost, right? We need to have one that. Um, yeah, I said that right, right. <laughs> okay. uh, we need to have uh, one um, that periodically we're charged for maintaining uh, access to the channel, for processing uh, or for keeping the channel open um, so that you can't just throw a channel up once and have it stay there forever. We also need uh, to include a, a spatial cost, which is um, how much storage is left available and how much do you want to charge for storage. Right? So if you have um, a cost, a spatial cost, um, that you pay once, 10 minutes, cool, um, and then uh, periodi periodically after that, uh, pay a time cost is how I imagine it going. Uh, so, cool. How does that fit with uh, our initial definition of state and of um, our descending condition on flow? Right? Well, like we did with introducing the tuple space grammar during the evaluation, let's just amend our definition of state. So a product of a rolling term and a tuple space, uh, we can think of as a state, right? And we, we, we want to say that essentially every, every time that I have uh, P and T, moving to P prime, T prime, where they're not necessarily different from P or T, but either one could be, um, that we also um, have that the measure for P, where we have a pair of conditions, that the balance uh, or operational balance for P is greater than operational balance for P prime. So we'll do an O here to denote operational. And that uh, the spatial flow for P is greater than spatial flow for P prime. Um, or sorry, here we have it. Yeah, for T is greater than that for T prime. Um, so basically, uh, shorthand for saying that if your process uh, performs an operation um, and that takes it to P prime, then P prime has to have less flow than P did. And if um, it performs an operation that affects the tuple space, say for example, adding a channel or updating, uh, updating a channel, um, that the flow allocated for storage must also be decreased. So just by kind of like amending it and turning it into a product and reformulating our uh, evaluation rules, um, we can include uh, storage flow, um, or at least the idea of it, um, in our evaluation semantics. So this proposal has channels tied to wallets that are funding them or, or flow packages that are funding them. Um, but it seems possible that multiple different parties could deploy contracts that are all listening on the same name. That that may be desirable in some circumstance. But then funding those, that some contracts may run out of money before other ones, that, that they may want to continue funding them. Um, Which is that um, in the case, in the case, for example, that someone else was uh, deploying the at foo contract at the exact same time, and that at foo had never been created before, we don't know which wallet is going to be associated with the channel when it's put into the store. So we don't know who's supposed to pay for it, and uh, kind of an open issue in in um, you know in kind of deciding this is what's the correct approach? Would it just be first come first serves? Uh, first come first serve. Um, that would be an easy solution, 
but it also kind of defeats the purpose of making it easy to reason about the cost of your program. Um, so that is an open question and something we're going to address in the breakouts this afternoon. Anything else? I know I've been going on for a while, but. Um, so how is the reduction context marking in the presentation of term calculi connected with this method? Do you mean, do you mean in, huh? Oh, okay. Are you talking about uh, term hole context? Yeah. Um, I hadn't, I hadn't considered, um, term context in, in this setting, but um, it's not a bad idea. I would, uh, I would, I would compare it to a, a process environment, um, which is uh, a mapping essentially normally from uh, names to channels, right? Um, but we do it with De Bruyne indices, so it's actually mapping from integers to uh, pars. <laughs> um, but, but basically, the, the channels available to a process describe its environment in a similar way that the context of a process um, describes the channels and interactions available to it. So if, what I would say is just naturally, if we can, um, if we can attach costs cost to environmental changes, then there would be a translation into contextual changes. Does that make sense? We would be able to attach, it, it seems like we'd be able to attach some analogous cost to term context, right? Um, and you bring up a good point, actually, um, which is that this would be like a really cool thing to investigate as just kind of a general, um, as a general exploration of row calculus, right? If you can attach uh, semantics to it, to like a, you know, like a term calculus and decide under which conditions it's growing or shrinking based on substitutions and reductions, um, and you can essentially get like a good idea for how um, rewrite systems, or you can prove termination for rewrite systems, which has been done before. And I think someone should do it for row calculus. I don't know who that'll be. Five minutes. Uh, any other questions? Cool, you guys have been great, thanks. <laughs>